I didn't, I didn't insult anybody else by saying that, I hope. <laughs> I thought it was very nice. Well, I'm glad. I'm, I'm in it. All right. Everybody all set? Yes, we're good to go, Kim. All right, let me, we call, have a quorum. Let me call the meeting to order. It appears we uh, have a quorum. I'm sure Dioga is making note of uh, cabinet members in attendance for us. Um, I want to welcome, uh, in addition to the cabinet members and the um, uh, various state agency people that are uh, joining that I can see. I welcome all of you who I can't see that I know are listening in around the state of Kansas. Uh, I think one benefit of uh, doing Zoom is that it probably makes this meeting really easier, more accessible to you. Uh, and so that, that's a good thing, although I have to admit, I, I miss uh, the in-person uh, so that we can have a different kind of interaction, I think. But anyway, good morning, everybody. Uh, we uh, have an agenda that came out, and we're, as far as I know, don't have any additions or corrections to that agenda. We're going to follow those uh, 10 items from welcome to adjournment, unless a cabinet member uh, has is aware of something we need to change on the agenda. I'm not, for those of you I can see, I'm not seeing any movement mm -hmm. like that. Okay. Staff is good. Okay. Uh, approval of the August 6th meeting minutes. Uh, have you had a chance to read those? There were um, um, a final Dioga corrected set uh, sent out after the first set. Um, and I have read those and I found uh, nothing to be corrected, but let me check. Anybody else have any additions or corrections or is there a, a motion to approve? Kim, I'll make a motion to approve. Uh-huh. This is Deanne. Yes, Dan. I didn't I'll join. make a motion. Yeah, I'll oh, make a motion you. to approve the minutes. Appreciate that. Uh, yes, we have Senator a motion. Sykes. Is there a second? I'll second. Senator Sykes. All right. Thanks, uh, Senator. Moving to seconded. Uh, all in favor, we're not going to do a we're not going to do a roll call. I can see uh, most of you. Um, and Dioga, I think you can see for purposes of the minute. All in favor, uh, thumbs up. Then I'll, I'm giving uh, a virtual thumbs up. And Diane made the motion. Uh, Tyler, are you in favor? There you are. Tyler, are you in favor of approving the minutes? Yes, I approve the minutes. All right. Any anybody in opposition? All right. I believe that's a, an adequate record of a vote to approve the minutes. I saw all all members um, saying yes. Nobody in opposition. All right, Amy, I guess you get to lead us off into real substance here. We're going to talk about um, the Community-Based Child Abuse Prevention Grant. Good morning, Amy Meek, and I'm the Early Childhood Director at the Children's Cabinet, and I am going to provide you with an update um, on where we're at with our CBCAP projects. Um, in August, at uh, the August 6th meeting, um, we uh, presented um, some recommendations for funding. We were waiting on our CBCAP annual award at that time. And so um, you all approved um, our three recommendations um, for us to uh, move forward with some discretion um, as we were um, probably, we were anticipating receiving that award before this meeting. And so those recommendations were to First, increase the current grantees awards in an amount up to but not to exceed their requested um, application amounts. Second was to fund our new grantee, uh, Lawrence Douglas County Health Department. And then third, work with other promising proposals to fully or partially fund additional projects. And so on the next slide, um, you have um, or our funding awards, and we're really pleased to report that we did receive our funding award about mid-September, um, and we are able to fulfill uh, what was approved in August. And on the next slides, I'm going to walk you through each of these uh, three um, categories in a little bit more detail on what those will entail. 
So on this slide, um, you see the current grantees um, and what they what they asked for. Our federal award that we received was um, just a little bit over a million three hundred seventy six thousand. The total that our current grantees asked for was um, pretty close to that amount at a million three hundred thirty eight thousand six hundred nine. So. Um, it couldn't probably have been any um, better as far as, as matching up to what those uh, two totals um, are to um, and how close they are. And so we are able to fund those and still have a little bit remaining that we can decide um, how to spend uh, later. So um, those are our current grantees. You see Elizabeth Layton Center um, that's in um, serving Miami and Franklin counties. Then our Family Resource um, Center, which has our Family Response Advocate um, down in the Pittsburgh area. Our three Kansas Children's Service League um, grants. One of those um, is our statewide um, grant. And then the Pony Express Partnership for Children, which is up in Marshall County and the Family Conservancy over in Kansas City, Kansas. Go to the next slide. Okay, so in the next slide, um, we also received some supplemental funding and um, this funding came with um, a little bit different instructions or guidance from the Children's Bureau. And they urged agencies to administer this CV cap funding um, under programs in ways that advance racial equity and support for those who have been historically underserved or marginalized by child welfare systems while ensuring the safety and well being of all family members. Another goal is to raise children out of poverty, um, noting that there's an emphasis on basic needs and differentiating between um, intentional neglect and poverty. Um, we also are to engage individuals with lived experience with this um, funding and these projects, and also um, an emphasis on primary prevention um, strategies, um, supporting primary prevention programs, um, with universal access to programs and services for families and children in Kansas. So I'm gonna walk you through what our um, projects are for our funding awards. The first one is the Lawrence Douglas County Health Department project. And um, we gave you a little um, information about that last time, but as a reminder, this is um, a program for prenatal uh, mothers, um, engaging them in parent education, peer support classes, also connecting them with home visitation services in Douglas County, helping them to um, complete forms, um, apply for other services. Um, so this will be in Lawrence in Douglas County. The second project is with the Southeast Kansas Public Library System. And this is um, a project that will um, introduce a family engagement model um, beginning in the Iola Library in Allen County. And so they want to um, start there with a, um, a model that will include more family engagement activities in the library, weekly story time, um, more events, and then um, hopefully replicate that um, across their other, um, the libraries in their, in their system. The third project is the community children's service or community children's center um, that um, in Douglas County, and they want to establish a family resource center um, this will have goals of increasing accessibility, availability, and affordability of high quality child care slots, also recruiting and retaining high quality trauma informed child care providers um, through a professional pipeline with support services, and then also direct access to concrete supports for families. So this is an exciting project to um, get a family resource um, center established. The fourth project is a preventative legal services um, this is uh, support universal access to high quality multidisciplinary legal supports. This will be in Shawnee County and it's a robust primary prevention strategy um, called the Kansas Holistic Defenders. And it aims to support universal access to high quality multidisciplinary legal supports. This will be legal services consisting of a civil attorney and also a nationally trained client advocate and in collaboration with community supports to ensure that there's a wraparound of preventative services. The legal services will focus on supporting families with challenges related to housing, accessing benefits and other social determinants of health in order to support and stabilize families with basic needs. 
In addition, client advocates will support uh, families with navigating various systems, obtaining necessary paperwork, and receiving vital peer support for overcoming systemic barriers. Um, this is a model that serves to strengthen families and prevent uh, family crisis. So we're, um, we are wanting to do these um, as three-year pilots because um, our supplemental funding has a little bit of a different timeline than our annual funding. And um, these are, are new projects. And so um, a three-year uh, pilot would give them a good um, amount of time to get established and started. Um, we can evaluate those, those programs um, over those three years. The third piece of our funding um, is the CBCAP demonstration project. And um, Melissa brought you some information about this at the February um, meeting. So as just a little um, reminder about that, this is um, a project that aims to reimagine our system as a support and partner to parents and children, um, responding to families experiencing a life disruption before it becomes a crisis, um, and also empowering local communities and families to be architects of programs. Through this um, demonstration project, we'll build an innovation hub for a post-pandemic private, public-private partnership structure, amplify the reach of innovation, um, and also employ strategies for addressing systemic barriers. These um, projects um, will, will consist of two um, different projects. The first one is a rural Kansas preventative legal services project. And we are aiming to um, do this in Southwest Kansas since the um, other legal services project um, I mentioned will be um, in an urban area. We really want to do something in a, in a rural um, setting. And so we think um, Southwest Kansas would be a, a great um, place to do this. This will be a, par a part of the continuum of primary prevention legal services. And um, I should also note that DCF is going to be funding three pilots also in partnership with Kansas Legal Services and other parts of the state. So um, this is um, an opportunity to, to work with our state agency partners also. Um, and then the second part is a community-led uh, pilot projects. We're hoping to do two to three, depending on um, how the community's discussions um, uh, turn out. These um, will involve uh, community conversation approaches to learn more about how communities, caregivers, and families define well-being. Um, we plan to have community conversations, um, and these will be facilitated by local organizations uh, comprising historic of con historically marginalized and under heard voices and perspectives. We're going to get a summary of those conversations and recommendations, analyze those, look at other data, and then um, use that to inform two to three test pilots and projects. Right now we have some initials, initial discussions scheduled in Marshall and Shawnee counties. So that's kind of a, um, a pretty uh, large um, uh, update and overview of, of of some really exciting uh, things that we are going to fund. And um, of course, bring you updates. This will be part of our um, evaluation and what we'll bring you as our, um, as our annual evaluation as well and give you updates throughout the year of these um, projects. And I can answer All any right, questions. let's see if there are. Let's jump see. in there if there's something I forgot to. No, yeah. Amy, thank you. I just, I, I I applaud the the description that you just gave is I, I don't have anything to add to that per se. I just want to emphasize, um, Amy mentioned the collaboration with DCF. The legal service projects are all, an outgrowth of a, a, a project that we've been partnered in since the beginning of, of this calendar year. Um, it's a federal mentoring project that involves the um, Administration for Children and Families and um, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, the Annie E. Casey Family Foundation, um, and a, a number of states that were selected to be part of this project. It's called Thriving Families, Safer Children. So we have been engaged in, in deep discussion and, and um, planning for upstream primary prevention practices to help 
us reimagine our child welfare system as a child well-being system. And the, the legal service approach is one that, that has been emphasized as it, one of the more common reasons that families end up broken up with children being removed from the home because you know a disruption that is unmet with support ends up becoming a crisis for families. So it may be, uh, and, and you know we have a, a, a legal aid um, set of services in in the state, but there's often a backlog. There, they, we, our families, there can be conflicts of interest. There's just a variety of reasons why it can be difficult to drive the kind of legal support um, it, in in the time frame necessary um, before a family is actually under investigation and children are removed from home. So this, these are all um, concerted effort to, to, pres to keep families together safely. And so we have, you see several different legal service projects spread across our three different um, funding streams here. Um, that is part of a larger effort so that there is some reach statewide. So we're really excited to embark on this. Um, in what is really a, a fairly well-coordinated effort. Um, there was a separate federal grant that um, the cabinet participated in a team that, that helped plan the um, proposal submitted to the, the federal um, office of childcare. Um, the KU School of Social Welfare led the writing of the the proposal and a, a number of partners were involved. Um, so DCF will be the lead on that, but it's it's a similar approach to things. So we're really excited to have landed that grant as a state and, and to be able to try some new things. Um, so I, I let the cabinet um, take it away with questions for Amy or me. Kim, it's Monica. Yes. I just want to say um, this legal service concept is I just really applaud that it's spreading and that we're coming to the realization that this is indeed a barrier for families. Um, we were using this um, format in our federally qualified health center for several years during a pilot. And it is amazing what one or two hours with an attorney um, can, how it can change the lives of families and get some serious barriers out of the way. So I, I, fully support the concept. And I think we need to keep it on our radar as a way that we can do some really intentional direct service in a, in a fairly easy way. So great. I totally support the idea. Thank you. This is Lietta. I would love to add to that. Um, this is a huge need. So I love seeing the legal services at it. So thank you for coordinating that. It's exciting. Anything else? Well, I've got a couple. Um, it, on these demonstration projects, uh, especially the second one, I guess I'm concerned that we have um, appropriate evaluation in, a, in place for a demonstration project and something beyond what, if we're gonna, if they are a demonstration project, uh, are we building in money in the budget for extraordinary uh, evaluation to really see if we are demonstrating something? Yeah, Kim, I, I have full faith in our teams from WSU and the um, KU team as well. I, I think together they do a, a commendable job of, of really detailed analysis for us. And yes, that they, they these programs will come in under our our um, evaluation system, and we are looking at them as as, as a demonstration project. So there will be um, assistance along the way. We're not going to just uh, assume communities out there will get together and do planning. Um, there will be work to help help these projects get up and running and support along the way, and then the the appropriate type of evaluation on the back end, because we really do want to use, th this is one-time money. We're not expecting that either the supplemental award or um, the funds being used for the, the demonstration project will be repeated. We, we, we just need to operate on the um, assumption that, that it is one-time if it 
gets renewed, um, we will celebrate that and, and continue seeking projects to fund. But um, because the, this is structured to be a demonstration project, our hope is to, um, at, at the end of the, the time frame, to be able to actually demonstrate that these types of investments will will pay off with um, fewer children being removed to foster care and the the associated um, benefits both for family well-being and for the state in terms of cost savings and cost avoidance so it, it's two-pronged and and that is absolutely part of of the goal that that we have really for all of the the new projects and and existing ones is always to be able to tell our story properly okay so i i guess part let me be clear i understand that that our existing evaluators are going to be provided as in-kind support to these grantees or these projects and that there will be an evaluation that is designed specifically for these projects not just our normal rubric Jackie, are you able to weigh in to reassure Kim? Yes. Um, well, we are not able to provide it in kind um, because it does. It is a very different evaluation. Um, so, well, yes, Jackie, my, up my, idea, my idea about in kind was that that's in addition to the two hundred thousand that we're budgeting here. That's what I was after. Not not who's getting paid. Yeah. For. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, that's. It's already included in our CB cap contract for this year, but it isn't going to just be the same things. We're looking at different metrics for the demonstration project because we haven't included legal services before. Okay, that's that's my the reassurance I wanted to hear. Yeah, I mean the le the legal services has probably been researched and demonstrated, but the second one strikes me as perhaps original enough that it's going to have to have a special it, special approach it, it is, evaluating kim if i may um it is yeah. and i appreciate your calling that out um i think one of the things that is really unique from this is um we're trying to in, involve people at the community level with lived experiences um and really use the space to shape and address um and inform how the system needs to change to become a system of well-being. Um, it, it's going to be a huge pivot um, to not respond and provide remediation, but how can we go further upstream? And we really need to make sure that it's not one more program that isn't going to help families with what they need most. And that's, you know, addressing basic needs first. So then they can address and accept um, other family supports. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you're saying things that, that warm my heart, and um, I just wanted to be sure that we weren't skimping on the evaluation uh, if we're going to do demonstration projects. And um, I think it's pretty hard when you're doing primary prevention to get evaluation. Uh, so I'm glad we're, we're focused on that. Yeah, I'm we, sorry, I, I've got one more, Melissa. Um, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Kim. I just... I, I mean, I understand that this is supplemental funding and perhaps one-time funding, um, but I guess I want to be sure that in, in our minds and in the minds of these supplemental grantees, putting the demonstration projects aside, but the supplemental grantees, are we, do, do we think that subject to funding, we're welcoming, welcoming them into a repeated grant funding approach? Do they, have we, we communicated to them that the, that the supplemental funding may be used for one-time projects? What, what? Yeah, Kim, I appreciate that question because we see it with our, our routine funding through the, the, grant, the early childhood block grant where we feel like, okay, these programs are strong and, and you know, dependent on this funding. This is clearly what the, this is not subject to renewal um, because we we can't make that promise so we we do need to make clear and um, will award these in the manner that makes clear that this is this is it art but the idea being that we can demonstrate value for this and continue you know our our cabinet recommendations for our own budget is our, you know, include a request that we fund 
um, the statutory level that that says we get an additional two and a half percent a year, there are future opportunities for us to translate success with with requests for additional mon money that uh, you know the state budget would provide to us if if you know per, assuming and hoping that the the data can make, tell the story so we will this is this is definitely um these are awards that we're making with with no promise that they will be renewed okay in I, this, in this I, venue everybody else may have understood that i just thought it was important uh, as we think about the the future of the cabinet to be sure whether we're building up you know a, a body of work that we can expand or whether we're building up a body of work that we're yeah yeah, I, I, Kim, the, the project that I mentioned that um, the, the other federal grant award that was received the, um, through the, the, uh, the team effort and the School of Social Welfare, um, I, I understand it, it, that project, the, the KU School of Social Welfare will be responsible for evaluation of that legal service project as well. So we are not approaching this alone. We are blending a variety of funding sources so that we can have a statewide um, picture of, of the, the benefits of this approach. Too often families living um, in, in poverty end up being treated as if they are har willfully harming their children when we know poverty does not equal child abuse but but or neglect but the system doesn't always pick that up and differentiate and and this is our hope so that we can help families cope with with life events and and challenges that they would ordinarily be, be left on their own to deal with and that we can show that that when you separate out and and really don't stop punishing families living in poverty um I, th there's a lot to be learned from this, and I think a lot of, of potential upside when it comes to funding decisions down the road. Well, thank you. I, I'm sorry to have held the cabinet up on this. And my questions were not related, uh, Melissa, to any kind of concerns about the content or the directions of the projects. I was more interested in the structural aspects in terms of ongoing funding and adequate evaluation. So. Anybody else? All right. Well, that is an exciting report. Uh, it's seldom that uh, you guys get to come back and say, well, we got to do everything we, we hoped to do. We, and that, we, uh, even some things that we didn't think we'd get to do. So that's, yeah. uh, that's exciting. And, uh, and uh, certainly it looks like a body of work that uh, could be, uh, we can learn a lot from and, and help a lot of people. So, yeah, it, it's right. exciting for us to, to say we did everything you wanted and more. Right. Um, Amanda, I think you get to uh, move us into the preschool pilot uh, possibility of combining with the early childhood block grant. So I'm sure Melissa will have a few things to say too. Amanda, yeah, do you want to kick it off? I'd love to. Um, so, so this we, we're very excited about this project. Um, the the acronyms that you've got on your screen here. This is the Early Childhood Block Grant, which I know you all are familiar with, and then the Kansas Preschool Pilot, which is funded by a combination of Children's Initiatives Fund dollars and uh, temporary assistance for needy families or TANF dollars. Um, this is a program that, uh, as we've shared before, has been around since uh, about 2005-2006 um, and is a, an important source of funding for school districts to be able to supplement and, and for community partners to be able to provide preschool services. Um, we know that many programs and that, that many grantees receive funding from both the Early Childhood Block Grant and the Kansas Preschool Pilot. And so uh, we've been engaged in some really intentional work with the cabinet to consider how we might be able to align the requirements of those two programs um, with the end goal being that we really want this to be streamlined and simplified at both the local and the state level. So I really appreciate the opportunity to partner with the cabinet in this. And Melissa, I'll turn it over to you if you'd like to, um, to, to keep talking through these pieces. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. So last year, um, as we were drafting our 
RFP for the Early Childhood Block Grant, um, there were conversations between Amy and myself on, on the cabinet side and Amanda and her team member. Um, it, 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 to, to identify common characteristics of the two programs, we, we um, did not, neither program made big, you know, significant changes in the, the applications, but on the back side of things, as we were reviewing and get, getting set up for the review process, we, we identified areas in common so that we could, we could have some conversations and do an evaluation. What we saw was an opportunity to take that further and, and do more to align the two applications so that we can make funding decisions um, across both programs and, and better align funding. So I, I guess the, it, the, the shorthand of that is there are certain programs that get funding from both sources. So we wanna really identify how best to leverage the funding that, that each of the two programs have. So um, I, with the goal is, is to reduce the burden on the grant writing side and reporting requirements for grantees that receive the, the two different sources of funding, um, the either or um, and or both. Um, and, and on the, our, our agency side to create some efficiencies in the review process. So this is part of that overall effort to move us towards a common application. Um, this, is, this is just in that realm of alignment and blending and braiding funding to ensure maximum impact. So our teams have been working, we can advance to the next slide, I think. Our teams have been working together um, for months since both program awards were announced in spring. And we, we came up with a set of, of changes that need to be made. So Amanda can talk more about some things that the Kansas Preschool Pilot Program will approach differently. What I'm bringing you today is a, a set of four items that I think need cabinet discussion and approval of um, in order for us to update our, the RFP that goes out for the next round of, of program applications. So the first one involves a cap that exists in the Early Childhood Block Grant Program. Um, we have, as a cabinet, wrestled with this um, in, in the tenure of Kim and myself since the beginning. When we arrived, there were programs receiving more than the cap that was outlined in the RFP. Um, so we, we ended up lifting, we raised the cap, but it was still below what, what several programs were receiving. Um, I won't speak to past efforts and why that, that happened. It had to do with cuts to the CIF and then a restoration of funding to the CIF. So that's old news. But um, we have, since that first year, we have held the cap at, at firm and we haven't entertained lifting it. Um, there's crossover, as I mentioned. There are programs who apply to both and get funding from both. And if we are ever to align services to be funded through um, the, the, the most appropriate pool of funds, it may necessitate a, an award through ECBG that might be higher than the cap um, for particular programs. Um, we know there's need that grows. We don't get a, an honest sense of, of how, how much need exists with, with an arbitrary cap. So we will, the proposal would be to remove the, the award maximum from the, the language so that we have the flexibility and discretion to award um, appropriately between the two programs. That said, I don't want programs to think that the sky's the limit and anything goes because we will continue to be responsible with funding decisions and, and ensure that uh, we can serve the maximum number of children across the state. Amanda, is there anything that you can think to add to the description of the cap? I think that's clear. We Here we really want to make sure that um, 
you, you know, if a program is currently receiving the maximum amount from the early childhood block grant, and then suddenly they're applying for a combined um, program where uh, they, they perhaps also were receiving funding from the Kansas preschool pilot, we don't want them to have to cut their funding or reduce what, what they're currently receiving. I see nods, so I think this is making sense. Okay. Um, I, I, maybe it's best to move through the four and then have cabinet discussion unless there's strong feelings about discussing as we go. I, I think you're right. Let's hear okay. all the four and then we can develop okay. The, the second point is the at-risk criteria in our early childhood block grant application. Our program is focused on, on, on serving children who meet a series of, of um, things defined as, as being at risk, making that the first priority. Um, that absolutely continues to be our focus. So we're not changing that, but we, did evaluate the application and realize we're not we're not adequately seeking description of how programs we want them to describe to us the actions they will take right now we're we're it's more of a notation that this is the priority and and you know we seek uh, um, information that they are certain intending to do this, but, but we want this section of the application to um, ask for more of a description of the activities that they'll be undertaking um, to, to prioritize children in the risk categories. It will make it easier to align across the two programs. Um, Amanda, do you want to add to that? Absolutely. So the Kansas, so as we were comparing what was common and what was different about these two funding sources or, or uh, funding opportunities, the Kansas Preschool Pilot only requires that 50% of the children served by, um, by those grant funds meet an at-risk criteria. And in the context of preschool, that's really important because it means that at the local level, districts have and communities have additional flexibility to be able to build integrated programs where children aren't segregated uh, in classrooms based on funding source. And so, um, and at KSDE, we, we audit to that. Um, we, we have programs submit a, a roster of students who are served and then confirm that at least 50% of them meet that at-risk requirement. Um, so we really appreciate the, um, the flexibility of the cabinet in, in um, adjusting what's historically required for the early childhood block grant to say that 100% of children served by that funding source meet an at-risk criteria. Um, and 50% is something that uh, for the Kansas preschool pilot has been there since the, the um, inception of the program, I believe. Um, and it's tied to, again, half of the funding is uh, through that federal temporary assistance for needy families program. And so we, we each grantee receives funding from both funding sources. Um, and since those funds have to be spent to, uh, to support families who meet certain criteria, then um, that's the, the rationale behind that piece. The third point is um, the requirement in the early childhood block grant application that there be um, the programs provide 20% match with a, of that 20%, 5% is currently the amount that is the minimum amount of cash match and the other 15% can be in kind um, matching um, donations and activities. Um, we've really struggled with this with programs. Um, it, and it's, it's not something that the Kansas preschool pilot um, entertains. When I, I, I really gave a lot of thought um, to this particular proposal. And I did what I often do, which is to revisit the statute that, that um, set up the cabinet and gave us our direction. So included in the materials you received is the citation from statute that was the reason a, a match requirement existed in our grant program to begin with. Really, it, it doesn't tell us we must require the, the you know a specific cash match or, or that type of thing. It what it requires is community mobilization. So I, I would I think we will be 
more productive in working with programs um, and better off if we shift the wording of the RFP, uh, remove the 20%, which is just an arbitrary number. Um, but if we remove that requirement and instead, again, ask programs to describe um, the to demonstrate to us that they they are mobilizing community support, I think we'll be better off. I think programs will have an easier time um, stepping up to um, um, demonstrate to us the the support they're getting from their their local uh, partners and and community members. So that would be the rationale behind the, this third point. And the fourth one, um, there is an allowance that. Um, is called indirect funds that, that the, the grant allows. Um, on the KSDE side, the indirect amount is 8%. Ours in ECBG is 10%. So we, I, I'm asking to agree with KSDE and, and unify around the 8% number. It's, it's money, it's basically money that, that is not tied to a specific grant activity. Um, it, it's, a it, you know, it's eight percent of the award would would be flexible funding for the grantees to use for um, general overhead um, expenses. Um, so it's a two percent change to reduce from ten percent to eight percent. And I'll highlight in there as well that we are looking to the KSDE uh, Kansas Accounting Handbook for school districts, and we we think that. Um, there may currently um, we, we think that there are some uh, expenses that are being reported as indirect that actually might be direct expenses. So um, we, we think that that will be helpful. So with that, um, Amanda and I will stand for questions. Okay. Well, let's hear our questions. So uh, I guess we really have. Um, I mean, there's really an issue of do we. Do we, do we approve moving to this um, integrated process along with it, these four changes to make that process work, that more integrated process? That's how I see the issue. Yep. This is nodding, so maybe I got it right. Uh, what are the questions about that? Cabinet members? Kim, Monica Murnian. Right. Yeah. Um, so thanks, you guys. The 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 whole moving KPP money from Ed to Children's Cabinet has a long history, of course, and and I'm glad that you guys are are looking at this, you know, at the very ground level. I think it's I think it's great. Um, I wholeheartedly support the at risk criteria, staying as Amanda explained. Um, it's 100% of every kid at, at risk. It just changes the total flavor and. It, it just puts a lot of burden on local folks. And I'm, I'm glad that you guys came to that decision. I love the idea that we're taking off the caps. It should have been done a long time ago. Love that. Um, the match, um, having been a person walking around asking for cash match from people to get these awards, um, great idea. Um, and like you said, it was just arbitrary. It was just a number. Yeah. So I'm really glad you did that. Um, and the indirect makes sense. Um, but I'm still struggling with the what's this look like to local folks. So, um, you know, what, what does this, I know what the common app looks like. I know, you know, when you go in, but if I may say a school district who is just interested in what I used to call KPP, what yep. does this look like and how does it change for them? Absolutely. So there will be one application that says, all right, if you'd like to provide preschool, these are the requirements. This is what this needs to look like. And there'll be a set of questions and um, the school district will complete that single application. So they won't have to understand and, and try to guesstimate, okay, we'd like this much money from Kansas preschool pilot and this much money from early childhood block grant. Our goal is that because the requirements for the grants will be um, the same, that it, it a program it, it doesn't a program doesn't have to apply for those things separately or to understand any kind of difference between those two sources of funding. They can just say, okay, this is the amount of money that I'd like to be able to support preschool in my community. Um, and then on the back end, we do the work of reviewing those grants and then determining, 
all right, this is the slate that we'd recommend be funded out of Kansas preschool pilot. And this is the slate that we recommend be funded out of early childhood block grant. Um, and then for the course of the grant year, um, each of those, uh, whichever, if you're a grantee, you report to the appropriate entity. Um, so if, if you're a Kansas preschool pilot grantee, you get a letter that says, congratulations, you've received this much funding from the Kansas preschool pilot. You know, this is the schedule for getting paid. This is the reporting requirements. Um, or you, if you're an early childhood block grantee, you do that work with the cabinet. Does that make sense, Monica? Good. It does. And I'm, I want to, uh, sorry for being so weedy, Kim, but I want to make sure then that if I'm an ECBG grantee who has as one of my activities providing pre-K slots, mm -hmm. you're saying on the back end, your staff is going to say, we'll pull this piece out of here and this piece out of here. That could be an option. Yes. It, it potentially. Amanda, do you want to walk through? I know we, we, we have to hold these four criteria for a vote, but I, I think it might help if we talk about some of the alignment updates to the, the Kansas preschool pilot on the KSDE side. And then we can talk through like what this, like it may help it in your, make more sense. So Amanda, can you? Um, are, there, are there particular pieces, Melissa? We've got a slide up that. that mm. Terrific. I had, oh, yep. There we go. Thank you. I'd made my, um, I'd made the screen big so that I could see everybody's face. Uh, <laughs> so it was hiding the slides. Um, so we've got these pieces here and these are the pieces where we don't expect all of you to be deeply familiar with the current requirements for the Kansas preschool pilot. Um, but these are some of the adjustments. So if I'm a current Kansas preschool pilot grantee, um, here's what could be expected as we shift to next year. Um, so currently when we're thinking about evaluation tools um, and, and um, so we, we have each program tell us, this is the evidence-based assessment that we use in the areas of social emotional learning, literacy and math. Um, and so a, a program is able to submit a proposal um, and we're able to review those to confirm that it's something that's acceptable. That's a little less prescriptive obviously than what the, the cabinet has done to date. Um, and so for those who are already using uh, my IGDs, the, the assessment tool, they'll be expected to continue doing so. Um, but if a program is using a different measure, a different assessment tool, they'll be able to continue that process of submitting it for us to review and confirm that it's something that could meet uh, requirements so that, it, so that we can measure growth uh, of children over time. Um, in terms of requirements for uh, quality. We, we both had kind of slightly different approaches to how we were um, determining preschool classroom quality. And so um, we'll continue to uh, require preschool classrooms to, through that same process, let us know what curriculum they plan to use for the year. So that'll be an adjustment for early childhood block grantees, but we'll, make, we'll remain the same for Kansas preschool pilot grantees. Um, the minimum number of instructional hours that will be required will remain at 465 instructional hours delivered over the course of the grant year as a minimum, um, and that is something that's aligned with requirements for school districts. Um, so this would be new for early childhood Black grantees, but uh, no, I, I think I think Head Start standards are used. I, so I don't think this is Amy. I think we've talked about this, have we not? Yeah, mo most of our programs are, are providing um, actually more than that through mm -hmm. full day childcare services. So, yeah, yeah. see that. Sorry, that's what I was slide. trying to say. Thank you. Um, and then uh, we, we require for the Kansas preschool pilot that there be at least one meal or snack provided per classroom session. Um, and so, and um, that aligns with childcare licensing. And so, um, it, it, it will be written into the requirements, but it won't be uh, a change in practice for many programs. Um, we will uh, require that, that programs participate in their local interagency coordinating council, which is um, currently a requirement for Kansas preschool pilot grantees. Um, and then we'll pull together the grant assurances so that, um, so that we're able to align the, the basic pieces around fiscal and operations. So we've got work that's been done on the budget templates and different 
parts of the application to speak to the question about what this looks like for applicants on their side. Um, the, the new design will allow us to tease out those differences such as, you know, which set of evaluation measures. So basically we will continue to um, require that early childhood block grant recipients use the common measures. Um, if, a, if one of these, if, if there is a recommendation to shift a school district over to the block grant, this will be a discussion based on what they have submitted to, um, to show how they are measuring um, for the, the Kansas preschool pilot. So we, we will, this will be a, a, probably of all of the differences, this one is, is the one that will require us to do the, the most analysis um, to ensure that we can um, incorporate new programs into our evaluation portfolio. So um, I just, I wanna call that out because that, that will take some work for us to absorb a new program, but um, nobody, in either program, it uses evaluation metrics that aren't reviewed by the granting entity. So we've, we've talked to the um, evaluation teams and they're ready to assist us with, with this um, shift. Okay, well now let's see if there are additional questions. Is everybody thinking here? Kim, this is John Wilson. Um, and I would just, um, I want to kind of layer on top of Monica's comments and just share my appreciation for the work of being put in to streamline things and to, um, to find kind of common areas. Uh, and I think this is made possible by the highly collaborative nature of, of the team of people across agencies. And so my question is, is do we think that this new process uh, can uh, withstand a uh, time that may come, I hope it never comes, where maybe the, there's not as, as strong of communication and collaboration across agencies. Yeah, um, deep breath and, and lots of hope that, that this is a hypothetical that we don't have to deal with. I would say across administration changes, there can be leadership changes at the top as um, new administrations um, install new secretaries, the potential always exists that there are changes down the line. But I would tell you my, that the staff of the cabinet has, has bridged multiple administrations, the staff um, at, at our partner agencies, many, many longtime state employees doing the, the positions they do with great skill and dedication. And so it, it is my hope that, that this makes it, this is successful and makes enough sense from the standpoint that the intention is to create a more effective and efficient system for both the grant applicants and the state agency um, from a staffing standpoint. So I, I hope that we can defend this and protect it um, through the future, I, the, this, the, our, our intent is to embrace this as a, a, an updated way of, of doing our grant making. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think this does, these changes reflect the type of common sense changes that anybody I think can get behind regardless of kind of uh, affiliation. Um, but and I think it's an, uh, it's an important reminder to us as cabinet members who span administrations or kind of larger scale changes in state government that to to protect this type of process. Thank you for that. Well, I do think one of the one of the things about this is that actually neither neither uh, the cabinet nor KS uh, DE are losing actual control of decisions about who is awarded their grants. It is it is a shared process, and the, and the give has simply been in uh, some of the requirements related to the to the grants, not in terms of the ultimate control of the award. If I, is that accurate? That, yeah, that's a good call out, Kim. Kansas Department of Education is, um, 
you know, it, it has Article 6 of the state constitution endows the State Board of Education with authority over um, the education, uh, um, you know, the, the, the um, I should know this, it should be burned, it, I should be able to recite the language, but um, the educational interests of the state are governed by the State Board of Ed and the, the commissioner that they hire. And then the Children's Cabinet also has statutory power over the, the decisions in the, the um, early childhood block grant in particular. So. Um, we oversee the entire Children's Initiative Fund, but the legislature does certain funds as pass through. It's the block grant program that, that we have our cabinet discretion over. So those changes, uh, I don't see that changing. So I think the, I, the, 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 I think the partnership can survive. The, the, the collaborative nature of our work, we'll talk a little bit later in our agenda among the agencies and, and kind of brief you on the, the, the state of, of collaborative efforts at this point. So thank you for the question, John. And Kim, I appreciate you highlighting that these funding sources will remain separate. So um, there is there could hypothetically be a different approach where um, where there was legislative change and where these funds were combined, that's not happening. They're going to continue as separate. We're going to track them separately. Um, and they're, they're, the reporting will be separate and we'll be able to clearly delineate um, which funds did what. Well, and I think it's, you know, we all, we all know that the ACBG grants uh, in, invite proposals and fund groups that are doing activities that are not preschool. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, I mean, th this is really helpful uh, primarily to a subset of grants, um, and and these changes we're proposing uh, don't seem to have any particular negative impact on on the other uh, grants. So, is that all right? Let me just check one more thing. Anything else? Any questions? I think I think a motion to approve our involvement in the combined RFP and the, the necessary uh, rule changes is, uh, as outlined is probably what we need. If we want can I jump in and share one important piece sure. that I forgot to earlier? Sure. Thank you everybody, this is Amanda. Um, the, the piece that I am most excited about in all of this uh, actually relates to the budget template and Melissa alluded to this, but as part of this, we're going to ask school districts to show and to demonstrate that they are first reinvesting the funding that they're receiving through the school finance formula um, for their preschool students with disabilities, for their preschool students who meet certain at-risk criteria, and then the additional funding they receive for any of those students whose families' incomes would qualify them for free lunch. We'll ask districts to show us that they are reinvesting those funds, their special education funds, and their Head Start funds if they get them into their preschool program, and then request these grant funds to fill the gap. Um, and that's something that's really exciting as we reflect on the changes that have been made to the school finance formula uh, in the years since the Kansas preschool pilot was established to increase the amount of funding that's available at the local level. So as we think about sustainability and really supporting local programs and using the resources that they have available to build strong preschool programs, um, that's going to be a shift, but we are very excited with the tools that we've put together to help programs budget in that way. Thank you, Amanda. Kim, I would just note that um... Um, Terry Rice has, uh, is, I, unless I'm missing her on our, our participant list, she's not with us at the moment. And Monica messaged that she, she had alerted me she had a work-related meeting to step into. Um, so her message was, I'm stepping away now, but I am supportive of these changes. So technically not a vote, but it, a vote of confidence in the proposal. So oh. just- Do we have a motion? Do we have a motion? So the motion would be that um, pertaining to the four points that, that we outlined. Well, I for, think it'd be okay if the motion also said that we authorized combining yeah. our, our RFP into this and with KSD and okay. four changes. That's the motion, I think. That okay, so uh, Kim, I'll, I'll make that motion. It's John Wilson. Uh, I move that we 
uh, combine the RFP and uh, approve these four um, updates to the requirements. Sir. Thank this you, is Lietta. I'll second. Thank you, Lietta. We have a motion and a second. We've had time for questions. Now is there for discussion? Hearing none, uh, I'll call roll. I think we need a roll call vote on this. So, uh, Lietta. Yes. Deanne. Yes. Good job in that car. Uh, Delise. Yes. Um, Monica's absent. Terry's not here. Uh, Tyler. Yes. Uh, Senator Sykes. Yes. Uh, John. Yes. And myself, yes. All right. And I do want to congratulate the good work. Uh, you know, we've all said it, but it is just strikingly wonderful to Thank have, you. Uh, you know, our state government working to minimize effort and requirements on local programs. And also, uh, I think this is going to give you the opportunity to really have a good look at these programs you're funding, their total financial picture, and how they're really using all their funds, and are they, you know, effective and reasonably. So that's great. All right. Thank you, staff, uh, for that effort. Uh, Melissa, you want to bring us up today on preschool development grant? I would love to. Um, the, the preschool development grant continues to be a bright spot um, because of the work that it is enabling that to be done. Um, the, the underlying structure for all of the collaboration is this, this particular program. Um, in, in the interim since August, when we last met, uh, we have launched the Kansas Future Fellows Program, which I am incredibly excited to, to describe to you. It is um, a, a, an innovation program. It, it's, it's our own little think tank, if you will. It's an initiative we developed um, the University of Kansas Center for Public Partnerships and Research um, teamed up with us and um, brought in foresight experts at a, a consulting firm called Open Fields to help support the work. Um, it, as far as I know, this is the first time that we have a structured statewide network of ambassadors dedicated to futures thinking um, strategies for advancing solutions to problems ex that that young children and their families experience, but but looking ahead and really beyond. Like we've done our five year strategic plan. Agencies do that all the time, but this is really a, a, a higher level of 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 future oriented thinking, like a big picture, long term, and where do we want to be with our program in the future. Um, the creation of the Kansas Future Fellows was in direct response to the ever rising number of social, economic, health, and political in inequities that affect the state's ability to support children and their families. Future Fellows aims to build the skills we need to imagine and then act on fresh future focused opportunities benefiting the well being of Kansas children. Um, and really, you know, we just want Kansas to continue to, to migrate towards being an exceptional place to do business and raise a family. So the future fellows are, um, the first cohort is 11 strong. We, we announced um, the roster was part of a, a public announcement made, um, I think yesterday. The, the announcement went out because I saw a news story last night. So they, they've had their first meeting and are, are working to, um, so we're having futures thinking labs, which I know sounds crazy, um, but it's really exciting work. And it's, it, it involves some training and practice in foresight skills, mapping trends and developing scenarios to help define the future of the field. Um, we have had an introduction to anticipatory governance and we'll continue to explore how new models of responsive governance can be applied here in Kansas. Um, it's, it's exploring leadership skills for systems change. Systems change is hard, it's adaptive leadership work. It's, you know, we, we often our minds go right towards the technical side of, of proposals. And it, it's, 
it really change management when you're you're guiding systems level change involves um, building confidence in the people that have to navigate change and, and work in very complex environments. Uh, state agencies have uh, many, many different layers of, of rules they have to follow, federal um, and state law, federal and state rules and regulations. The, the every dollar, every penny that, that any agency has to work with comes with multiple sets of rules and guidelines. So navigating the complexity of all that and managing the, the feelings of the people being asked to approach their work differently requires um, a, a, a slightly different leadership skill set. So we're working on that through the, the next um, nine months. And then developing a future impact scenario using research data and trends that are curated in this cohort of, of, of future fellows to paint a picture of the future that we would like to design for Kansas. So we had our first sessions the, in, the first, in the week of September 20th. We had hoped to meet in person and do a dinner and then a, a day long convening the next day um, in the Overland Park area. We switched to a virtual meeting and the fellows embraced the, the occasion um, and did a phenomenal job with, with that redirect. Um, they, and I, I'm really, pleased. I've heard from one of them that several have been having offline conversations and thinking about some projects they want to engage in. So it has already sparked um, imagination and creative thinking in terms of, of new and different approaches to things. So I will quickly review the cohort that was chosen. We, we have Dr. Craig Carell from USD 445, which is the Coffeyville Public Schools. Um, Coffeyville was one of the, the first, um, I, I did the, the model they put together 10 or 12 years ago is a community-based early childhood program that is a, a, the school district is a full partner and they've been a leader in that realm. Um, Tatiana Darby is a public health practice researcher from the University of Kansas Medical Center. We have Lana Duval, who's the president and CEO of the Finney County Economic Development Corporation. Jason Grant is the lead pastor at um, the um, United Methodist Church of the Resurrection in Overland Park. He is the, the kids core children and family ministry um, head and they, they have prioritized early childhood programs. Um, in, in their, their outreach efforts. Lynette Keough is the program supervisor from the Native Connections program. Jennifer, oh, I'm gonna have trouble with her name and I apologize to Jennifer. G Jennifer Keomany um, from the Department of Obstet Obstetrics and Gynecology. Um, she's the man department manager at the University of Kansas School of Medicine in Wichita. Brittany Lemon is the mental health and disabilities specialist for Child Start. Marcy Penner is the executive director of the Kansas Sampler Foundation. Travis Rickford is the executive director of Live Well Northwest Kansas. Tabitha Rossbroy is the early childhood support teacher from USD, which is the Olathe Public Schools. She also is, um, the, she's just ended her, her tenure as the National Teacher of the Year, which is um, remarkable that a preschool teacher was, was, was chosen in 2020 to be National Teacher of the Year. It, her tenure was extended because of COVID, so she has just wrapped that up, um, but we are delighted um, that she has, has ability to join us. And then Jonathan Sublette, who's the lead pastor at the Fellowship High Crest Church, and he's chairman for Scent Incorporated. Um, which uh, if the cabinet recalls in December, we gave a one-time grant to the Scent Prep Academy. So this group of 11 people you can see is um, diverse in terms of background and um, the, the skills and, and focus areas they bring to the equation. So we have um, people devoted to 
health issues, we have public health represented, we have mental health, we have children with special needs, we have tribal representation, we have geographic diversity, we have um, even age. We A couple of these folks are just at the, the, the um, entry level of their careers that you know they're they're a younger cohort that are teamed up with folks that have been doing this for many many years so we are excited about the the group of people that has joined to be our first um fellowship and i i I couldn't be more excited about the work that is about already underway so we will continue to bring you updates on their progress. The, the work, the, the first um, cohort will, will culminate their, their year in May. The intention is to have a, 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 future, a futures forum that, that will be a more open opportunity for more people to participate. So stay tuned for news on that. Um, lots of other work happening. I'll try and go a little more quickly through some of these are just um, ongoing projects. We are drafting an RFP that will be going out to um, seek a vendor for the workforce registry project. And we have a draft version of the professional career pathway for early childhood providers that we are very excited about. It's gone through months and months of refinement and, and um, in, we've taken input from the experts themselves in the field and, and we've had an implementation team doing a deep dive into what other states do and, and we've really adopted a, a pathway plan that I think will work well for Kansas that will embrace longtime providers who have been doing the work who who will not be left behind simply because they are not um, in a place in their lives where they're going to start taking college coursework. Um, so we will recognize expertise and, and experience. We will um, offer different pathways depending on a uh, desire to pursue a two-year degree, a four-year degree, um, a pathway for people entering the field where they can um, take the, the kinds of, of trainings and um, develop a portfolio and be accredited that way. So, so stay tuned for some very exciting work. Both of these represent the first time that Kansas will have aligned um, career, like there's always been um, offerings for different, different paths into the profession, but this is an organized approach in concert with the workforce registry. And um, we are excited at this, this project. It will also include the links to quality program that is supervised by DCF um, as part of quality um, improvement and support for our early childhood professionals. So that one is making progress. Um, early childhood integrated data, um, we do have an authorized project that our, our um, data trust met and approved earlier this summer. Um, it is looking at historical early childhood block grant data and um, comparing notes with the, um, the um, Division of Child Welfare to, to really evaluate um, the, the strength of participation in our programs uh, with outcomes in the child welfare system. So there's data sharing and, and cleaning and matching and all of those, those processes underway to, to um, be able to begin to evaluate and describe um, the overlap, how many children were involved in both areas, demographics, um, the services received prior to DCF involvement, is there any pattern that emerges? Um, basically, you know, just a series of, of research questions to um, determine if we can see patterns and influence decisions um, for changing things that, that need change and, and improve things for kids. Um, the team will be across our four state agencies will be involved in a federal virtual convening for the, the preschool development grant program. Um, it was 
it, it's been several years since this was held in person. Um, so it can be challenging to attend a, a virtual convening spread over four full days, but we're gonna tag team and we're gonna do it. And we're gonna learn a lot because there's a really great agenda in, in place for, um, um, support and 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 the sharing of ideas for all of the states involved in this effort. Um, I'll be involved in a presentation on our early childhood integrated data work with um, Terry Garska from the KUCPPR team. We've got other team members and in, in other panel discussions. So Kansas will be well represented, and we're looking forward to it. And then I my. My favorite new project is Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. We went out with our announcement a couple of weeks ago. We are working with um, six counties to, to onboard. We, they, there's, there are six counties that do not currently have the program and do have a local partner willing to step up and provide 50% of the cost. And we will match with 50% from our preschool development grants. We, um, uh, we will also be working to continue to onboard where we can and, and help um, really the, the goal needs to be some focus on securing longer term funding for this program than just the, the one year of preschool development grant funds that we have to offer at the moment. So um, I am going to look for support from the Kansas legislature to support the cabinet recommendations for additional funding. I think there is a, an avenue to create um, in our children's initiative fund, some funding dedicated to this project. We will be bringing data um, forward that, that the, the Dollywood Foundation has been doing this work for uh, I, somewhere between 15 and 20 years, and they they are the keepers of the data. Um, there's a, a lot of, of control and privacy for families signed up, but aggregate data that shows improved outcomes and, and improved um, literacy skills to prepare children for success in um, their their kindergarten through 12th grade journeys and beyond. Um, so we will be working with the Dollywood Foundation to bring data forward to support the, the rationale for um, embracing this program as a truly statewide um, opportunity for all families. All right. Uh, if that concludes the presentation, let me check and see if you have any questions. Anybody? All answered? Okay. Very All good. Right. There's lots more, but those are the highlights I wanted to share with you today. All right. All right. Well, so on. this one is um, less, less, it, le we're not really predetermined here. I just thought this was a good opportunity because our agenda is, it was somewhat lighter, a lift for the cabinet at this meeting um, with just the one activity to, to take a vote and have, have the deep discussion on. I really invited our state agency partners to the table um, to come talk about kind of a, a state of early childhood from agency perspectives. We've, we've all, we are, are still in, unfortunately, an unprecedented time where we have seen, um, we knew before COVID hit, there was stress on the early childhood care and education system. Um, that as the baseline um, to be dealing with the pandemic 18 months on, um, we, I, I just wanted to give our agency partners a chance to bring forward updates and, and any this is really, I don't, I'm not gonna guide discussion per se through this. Um, I, I love cabinet member questions and observations as well. And then we can see where this discussion takes us for, for a little bit of, of our agenda time. So I, I don't know who wants to go first um, among the agencies. I don't wanna necessarily put anyone on the spot. Just, do we have a volunteer? Sure, good morning. This is Tanya, I can go first from DCF. Thanks. Hi everybody. I think I've got a, a couple of technical updates, but then I can just speak to sort of general activity as well. Um, 
you know, I've, I've appreciated sort of being a little bit more involved in the past year, learning about all of the incredible work and support and innovation that's going on with early childhood. You know, one of the pieces that DCF is committed to is we're supporting childcare aware as they do the childcare sustainability grants. And that's, you guys might be familiar or remember that that's where providers, depending on their size, can just go onto a site and they can apply for different grant amendments or um, amounts, not amendments, sorry, uh, to help them with various parts and pieces of their operations and business. And that might range all the way from $5,000 up to $60,000 for a really large provider. I think that is brought home to us. We wanna be flexible in supporting needs so that whether it's their physical environment uh, or other needs they have, that we're really making sure that we're creating everywhere in Kansas, accessible childcare, um, safe, healthy, and really thriving communities where folks can provide this service and really be a service in their community. I think that's We've learned so much about that. In addition to that, you know, definitely some sense of universal home visiting has really come to the front about how important that is for so many reasons, how important that is, but definitely the nexus with some of these programs. But I, I feel like what I've learned or come to appreciate is that universal home visiting really impacts so much of well-being of families and communities. And it's it's sometimes even bigger uh, than, you know, early childhood, if you think about it, in terms of the impact and school readiness and everything. And we, we're committed to those concepts. Quality, none of that happens without a quality workforce. None of that happens without businesses and other innovators in communities that have an opportunity to say, hey, this is really what we need. How could we make it happen? Or how could we partner with someone else in the community, a school, a big employer? You know, it's the collaboration that's really needed. We also look forward to looking to others to help us with that expertise so that we can make sure that that whole system of early uh, childhood, early child care, early care is really connected in the community. And that's that's really what we want to support. And we know it takes additional resources and we want to be part of that discussion about how to use those resources in the best way for the best return on investment. A couple of details that I think might be new updates for you, uh, but maybe some of you heard a couple of these, but these are sort of smaller updates. So in terms of in response to the pandemic, we're going to be using uh, child care development funds to cover, and those are through specifically through the American Rescue Plan, so very specific to that pandemic source, from November of 21 all the way into, not November, sorry, September, last month of 21, all the way into September of 2023, uh, DCF is partnering with KDHE so that the fees associated to the licensing application and the background check fees are all waived, and we're going to be covering that. Specific, specifically with American Rescue Plan funds. So if that's ever come up, I don't know if it's come up in this conversation because it's kind of detailed, but we are committed to really supporting providers in that way. Uh, the other reminder is that the second round of those sustainability grants that I just mentioned, where depending on your size, you can, you can apply on a child care where site, that starts today. And so we have a second round that's going to go today all the way through uh, November 5th, so about a 30-day period. Uh, we just finished one round uh, on or about August, and we're in the round two right now. And, and I think that's it, Melissa, unless there was something specific you were hoping that DCF would mention. No, I, I appreciate the, those updates. Um, we can continue around the table. I will have a couple notes from Department of Corrections, Hope, Cooper is out. Um, I had a, a personal issue come up, so she sent me a couple bullet points, but um, I'll defer. Okay, who's, who's next? Hey, go ahead, Kelly. I'll volunteer. Hi, guys. My name is Kelly Mark. I'm the Director of Administration and Policy in the Bureau of Family Health at KDHE. I am standing in for regular representation at the meeting today. So I have some high level updates um, from the perspective of KDHE child care licensing. 
If you have questions, I will probably have to get back to you with answers, but I'm here to write everything down and try to get the information that you need. So first, I just wanted to give an update um, as of like point in time numbers, what uh, type of facility count we have in child care licensing. So currently we have 4,499 licensed facilities, and that's a total capacity of 135,000. 330 um, child care slots. So I'm going to give some updates on some really high level initiatives that we have going. Some of them have already been mentioned by Tanya, so that's very exciting. Um, so all of these are in partnership with Casido and DCF, um, KSDE, and Child Care Aware of Kansas. Um, most of the funding made possible with the Child Care Development Fund and the Supplemental Child Care Development Rescue Funds as well. So we're working on the Child Care Health Consultant Network uh, and Facility Impact Grants. So Child Care Aware has been um, supporting and growing this network of child care health consultants um, to target consultation and support to facilities, especially facilities that are temporarily closed by COVID, and granting funds to those existing facilities to support their continuous operation. So that is ongoing from started January 1 of 2021 and ongoing until January 31st of 2022. Then we have an expansion of that child care, um, child care health consultant network. And that just started October 1st and is gonna go until 9.30 of 2022. And that's really expanding that network of consultants for our child care providers. So we're looking to add nurses to those child care provider consultant teams. Um, in case there's TA requests related to health and development of children in care. Um, we want referrals and warm handoffs to take place between surveyors um, and these consultants so that providers that need technical assistance that goes beyond regular surveyor capacity will have that person that they can go to to help them with funding opportunities and business supports and really getting them connected to anything they need to be successful. Um, we are going to do a formal evaluation that's going to be integrated into this um, to monitor increased reach and access and short, intermediate, and long-term um, impacts of the program. Um, Tanya already talked about the child care provider financial supports that we're providing um, with the funding from DCF in partnership with them. So the application and background check fees for existing licensees and providers and new applicants um, have been waived effective September 1st, and provided funding allows, that's gonna go through September 30th of 2023. We've had lots of really positive response from licensees on this. They're very excited about it. Um, and we're focusing on, uh, so a new project that we have going, contract is um, being implemented, getting worked out, all the details are getting worked out. But in partnership with DCF and Child Care Aware, we're going to be funding startup grants. And so that's for new providers, um, hoping to increase uh, access and capacity to child care across the state, as we know that is a great need. So we're excited about those. Um, those will be focused on paying and reimbursing for costs related to achieving licensure, um, training, inspections, space modifications, supplies, everything they need to actually be licensed and provide quality care. And um, other, other things will be determined based on provider input, mapping experiences, um, and other facility and workforce recommendations. So just wanted to quickly talk about the Child Care Licensing Systems Improvement Team. That's a team that meets regularly to address the childhood needs assessment findings specifically related to child care licensing. Um, it's a critical component of the early childhood care and education system. The SIT team has three work groups. We have a rural child care, maximizing a child care business work group, and then a regulatory work group. Um, recommendations from that group are shared back with KDHE, and then we see if we can um, uh, take those, take those um, recommendations and improve our program. Um, the backbone support for the SIT team is KUCPPR, and they also do facilitation for us. And working to align the SIT team with the PDG recommendations um, plan and state agency uh, recommendations submitted to the governor in July. 
Right now at KDHE, we are in the process of reviewing all of the current child care licensing regulations. We did a mapping project in partnership with KU over the summer to get feedback from on the, regula the regulated community on what barriers and challenges they had with our current regulations. Um, we've also been survey, uh, surveying surveyors to uh, find out what barriers they're seeing with our current regulations. We've got that all mapped out as far as here's what we see as a potential problem. Does this regulation need to be amended? Um, we won't be doing that in silo. We're, that's very collaborative work with a, a work group that's going to be formed by the governor as well as the partners that we have here on the call. Um, I think the last thing I have to talk about is the child, um, the CCDF final rule resulting from reauthorization in 2014 that requires those comprehensive background checks, including fingerprinting um, for workers and residents has been a challenge for us. So data has revealed to us that the waivers that were issued by the federal government intended to be helpful, um, but that's really resulted in, in thousands of folks being stuck in the process since they never finished their fingerprinting between 2019 and 2021 when that was revoked. Um, the waiver did expire on October 1st. So we're working closely hand in hand with facilities to make sure that they get um, their background and their fingerprinting requirements met. Um, we're not going at this as a punitive process, but instead really a supportive process. And how can we help you make sure you meet these recommend or these requirements now that the waiver has expired? So lots of work there. Um, and really that's all I have from KDHE. I will take questions. If I cannot answer them, I will make sure to take them back to the correct folks and, and get you an answer and follow up. Thanks, okay. Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Are there any questions? Um, I do have a, this is John. Uh, Kelly has a fantastic update and it just sounds like you all have been very busy. Um, <laughs> And uh, I was thinking about the startup grants that will be administered. And uh, my guess is that uh, uh, CCRNRs will help promote those grants. Are there non-traditional avenues that will also promote those like economic development folks or small business development groups? Or can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, we sure hope so. So after we get all the, the details finalized and the contract executed, then we'll be ready to, to start marketing these startup grants. So I would hope that we can get them marketed through every avenue that's possible. Um, what that seems to be one of those common problems is you have all these things that are available for providers, but not all providers hear about them. So it's something we're continually thinking about. But of course, we will go through all of the avenues that we have, as well as our partner agencies, and just hoping to get that message pushed out in any way possible. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about them on the Wednesday webinars that we do for early childhood, um, the early childhood recommendations panel. Like if there's any suggestions on other ways we can get that out, I would be happy to receive those and, and help us get the word out for folks. And Kelly, thank you. This is Melissa. I would add on to all of those efforts. Um, there is a growing number of communities across Kansas that are building community teams that involve local governments, um, you know, the, the, the local providers, the school districts, community colleges, um, private sector organizations. So economic development authorities are part of that um, team approach, um, other private businesses as well, and philanthropy. And they, we have received a, a a growing number of requests for, for guidance on, on how to navigate a lot of this stuff. So we have some key partners that, that we'll be communicating these opportunities with um, through cabinet channels to support both DCF and KDHE um, in, when these opportunities roll out. Um, it, it's, we, we're in a, a we're, we're at a crossroads right now. I, I, I want I would be remiss if I didn't um, point out that, that we are, so we are working as, as agencies within the lanes that our, our um, federal 
COVID relief dollars allow us to work in. And there's a lot of flexibility within existing funds to do things specific to recovery from the pandemic. So there's a lot that we can do, but there are limitations. And it's been mentioned in this meeting before that without a viable workforce, none of the rest of this really matters. And uh, you know the, the stress on childcare in particular, um, other aspects of the early childhood mixed delivery system, the, the continuum of services, we, we are struggling with hiring and, and retaining good employees just as much as any other business sector right now. And so there is a, a remarkable gap that that I see as I you know look from the balcony down on the work happening across very specific pr programs um, there are communities struggling with physical capacity um, and and you know have been doing local fundraising to build um, additional physical space um, while also seeking ways to recruit, and, and you know, build the workforce. Um, none of the funds allow for new construction. So I, I am really cheerleading the work DCF and KDHG are doing to um, get the, the program Kelly described, the, the startup grant program, because that's the sort of work where a church may wanna dedicate some space to preschool classrooms, but they need to upgrade a sprinkler system or add an egress door that meets fire marshal standards or bring a hand washing station into the classroom for the age group or any number of things that are minor alterations to existing facilities, those we can handle and, and are going to address. But the the project, you know, where I pick I could pick from a number, Garden City, Dodge City, um, Lindsburg, Southeast Kansas, Wyandotte County. There are communities, Emporia, they're all around the state want and need to build additional space and are struggling um, to go the, the final mile to, to being able to break ground and, and have funding for startup um, furnishings, the curriculum materials, just all of the things that have to happen. We've got an elementary school in Lawrence that, that the, dis, the school district um, shifted away from and so that facility will, the, the physical building will be turned into an early childhood center. They, they have what they need um, to do most of that work. Last I checked in on them, they need materials um, for classrooms. So I think that might be one of our um, involved in, in one of the projects we're trying to fund. But I, it, there's just a long list of areas where we need additional capacity and um, I, I, I just want to note that in the SPARC committee process, that's the strengthening people and revitalizing Kansas um, committee that, that was started last year in response to the CARES Act by the governor um, and the legislature this year put um, um, some additional structure in place. So there is a Spark Executive Committee that includes lawmakers and um, private sector members. Um, that committee is charged with making funding recommendations to the State Finance Council from a pool of discretionary dollars the state of Kansas has. Um, I want to note that the, the through that process, there is recognition that that early childhood needs to be a priority. Um, we are watching closely and cheerleading for that process to get rolling. They've been stuck on some decision making that needs to happen um, for um, longer than I would have hoped. Let me just, just smile and say, we, we're, we're rooting them on to, to make the progress they need. So my hope is that our, our sector will be able to bring forward um, some recommendations for additional resources to address some, some serious problems that the agencies are not going to be able to address with the funds they have to manage.
Melissa, this is Senator Sykes. I think that Spark Executive Committee is supposed to meet on the 7th to possibly move forward on some of those. So fingers crossed. Fantastic. I, I'm, I'm cheering them on. They've got um, some proposals for working groups on various topics. And I see early childhood fitting into at least two different working groups, whether we're talking economic revitalization and the role that that um, adequate reliable, good quality childcare plays for, for today's workforce and preparing the workforce of tomorrow. And um, there is, I think, health and education um, as, as another working group. And I know that the intention is to include um, early childhood needs in, in that um, set of work. So I, I am grateful that we're at the table and, and watching and rooting for that process to to get rolling. Amanda, do you feel comfortable that you've shared enough or do you have updates that weren't covered in, in the remarks that you've made to the cabinet already? Thanks, Melissa. I have just a couple of pieces to share and I will keep this at a very high level. I know we got in the weeds earlier and I appreciate getting into the weeds with all of you, but we will, um, we will not do that there. I, I want to um, underscore and, and reiterate a piece that Melissa shared uh, related to the stress that's being felt in the system right now. Um, for as, as we visit with recommendations panel members, as we are just engaged in other uh, conversations with folks who are running early childhood facilities in the state, I'm consistently struck by the level of stress related to try, being able to try to staff facilities and the number of classrooms that we have in the state that are sitting open and empty right now because um, providers can't hire the staff that they need to run the classrooms. So as, as all of you are, are considering and, and moving forward, I wanted to share that because it has been very striking um, to me to see a number of, of uh, leaders who have done incredible work to manage their teams through the last year and a half um, and to hear the, the challenges and the stress related to um, trying to keep classrooms open uh, and trying to both administer and run a facility while also constantly being in classrooms so that they can make ratio. Um, so I know that, that many of you uh, have those conversations and that that's not news to you, but I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't pass that along here. Um, from an agency perspective, there's two pieces that I want to share. One, uh, late September and early October is data reporting season for, for Kansas schools. So uh, in the next several weeks, we'll have some preliminary numbers for enrollment this year. And we're very eager to see what that will bring, knowing that um, over the course of the pandemic, there's been uh, a decline in, in especially young children who are enrolled in school. Um, so we'll be looking out for that. Um, and the other piece that I want to share is that um, in July through September, our agency and the State Board of Education, uh, as I shared previously, conducted a series of listening uh, tours and community conversations uh, through the Kansans Can Success Tour. That was really an opportunity to, um, to share back to, to Kansans the, the progress that we've made towards achieving our state's Kansans Can vision for leading the world in the success of each student, and also to, to gather feedback from Kansas communities about whether the priorities that the state board has identified, uh, including kindergarten readiness, are still good places for us to be focused as we are uh, moving forward, and especially recognizing that the pandemic has um, had huge, a huge impact on, on education. So we look forward to analyzing those, um, those results and sharing them in a more uh, systematic way. But at, at a high level, one piece that we've heard from districts and communities is that there's agreement that these priorities are important. Uh, and the next piece is it would be very helpful to have some models that we can point to um, that, so that communities can understand, all right, here's how we get to where we'd like to be. So one component of that is the Kansans Can Star Recognition Program. Uh, that's an opportunity for districts and for communities to apply for recognition in the areas uh, that the state board has identified as important. Uh, and so that includes the opportunity for districts to be recognized in the area of kindergarten readiness. Um, so we, we look forward to continuing to support systems as they improve in that area uh, and to recognizing additional systems in coming weeks and months. Okay. 
Thanks, Amanda. Uh, let's check in. Anybody else? Anybody else have some things to bring to the cabinet's attention? Justice Wall, I know you're with us. I'm wondering if, if there's anything from the court perspective that you would want to share. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I was hesitant because some of our updates um, don't directly address early childhood development. Um, but, you know, on the topic of um, families in crisis, children in crisis, maybe indirectly, um, yesterday, in fact, we kicked off our mental health summit preview. Um, unfortunately, it was scheduled to happen this week, but because of COVID issues and overwhelming response to the summit, um, it's been rescheduled for next, next spring. Um, but we had sort of a preview and, and it kind of reflects the collaboration and investment of um, all sorts of groups that are involved with mental health in the courts, uh, from legislative leadership to uh, obviously our court, um, all agencies, um, the, uh, the governor herself, and um, the idea being that the summit will bring in national and local speakers um, uh, who will educate and inform all the attendees, um, which will be stakeholders that deal with um, individuals with mental health issues that come into the court system with the idea being to uh, improve the court's handling and response to individuals with mental health, whether they come into the courts uh, through social services or through uh, criminal prosecution. Um, really the summit is a, a strategy and education summit designed to um, address an issue that's uh, of increasing concern um, to the courts and, and our families. So we're looking forward to that uh, next spring and we got a little bit of a taste of that yesterday. Um, additionally, uh, we recently published uh, proposed amendments to rule 174 um, that would require the judicial council forms be used in child in need of care proceedings. The idea there is that um, the district courts in these cases have to make very specific findings. Um, and that if they are not made, um, children and families uh, potentially could lose their benefit eligibility status. So our hope is by updating those rules, uh, we can ensure that appropriate findings are made in those proceedings so that um, those families remain benefit eligible. Um, that's about all we have in terms of indirect uh, connection to early childhood development, um, but happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, thank you for those updates. They are, I think, directly interested uh, for, to us. Appreciate it. Yes. Uh, sure. I, I wasn't going to call on people because I thought this was sort of a volunteer activity. Have we? Has everybody had a chance, though, to... Uh, to bring anything forward from agencies? Kim, I'll, I'll, on behalf of Hope Cooper from the Department of Corrections, she is the Deputy Secretary of Juvenile and Adult Community-Based Services. Um, she is traveling to, um, um, there was a, 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 a loss in their family. So she's, she's at a funeral um, and sends her apologies. Um, she sent, two bullet points. The Department of Corrections released two grant opportunities totaling $1.5 million for prevention services. It's a new grant program that was established from new legislation. So one grant is $1 million with no match requirement. The focus areas are runaway, homeless, crossover youth, and employment um, workforce development. The second grant is $500,000 and requires a dollar for dollar match. So it becomes a $1 million program. Both grant opportunities were widely shared and open to any entity to apply, not just uh, community corrections agencies. So um, I, I'm sure Hope will keep us posted as decisions are made in those programs. Um, but again, it's, it's another example of the focus being on prevention um, to help keep families from from ending up in crisis and, and in the, the 
system um, getting consequences. Um, Juvenile Justice Oversight Committee recommended to the Department of Corrections some changes in approved programs from the Evidence-Based Program Fund. The new recommendations include substance abuse treatment for families, parent engagement and system education and navigation, improvenile, improvements to juvenile defense, and culturally sensitive programming. Um, so my apologies, I can't elaborate on what that means, but it sounds like good action is happening to um, it, it that that is not necessarily an like it, it aligns nicely with with the work going on in in other arenas. Let's put it that way. So it looks like you know we are are marshaling resources from a variety of different places and and you know, continuing to pull in um, a, a fairly con consistent direction to, to support families so that they don't have the negative consequences of children being removed and, and investigations and court proceedings and all of those things. We, it, it, this isn't happening um, by accident. There is a state team that, that um, meets to create, there is a state plan that involves the, the court system, the, the Department of Corrections, I think child welfare, um, the cabinet. So, so our state team, I, again, it's one of those things, um, it's been a while since we had an in-person planning session, but we've managed virtually and, and um, met the, the responsibilities to, to keep a coordinated plan in place. So, um, just I wanted to note that. Um, so it, there's there's a lot of activity that layers on top of the regular duties that that the the universe of state agencies and and the personnel that that staff them um, are responsible for. That the pandemic has created. Um, high pressure for a lot of people. So I just want to note that the dedication and the effort in place to, to respond to input from, to, to take input from the community, from, from the folks affected, respond appropriately and move relief funds um, in a, a coordinated manner um, that is thought out but also with the knowledge that that time is of the essence. It is a, a pretty complex juggling act. And I, I think that when we can, I'm grateful to hear the SPARC committee um, has a meeting planned to get process um, figured out and, and get moving um, because that will be kind of, I, I view it as, as that find that piece of the puzzle that that we've we know exists we, but you know it's it's not not close at hand so that that puzzle piece will will help us really accelerate the the variety of of resources made available so that we can recover um, in a manner that leaves our our system um, improved for children and families Anything else in this discussion of agency updates? All right, Debbie, I think we're ready to hear from the uh, Childhood Advisory Council. Thank you, Kim. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I am Debbie Deere, the Early Childhood Systems Coordinator with the Cabinet, and uh, here to report on the recommendations panel. Just uh, for those of you joining in with us today, a reminder that the panel serves as an advisory group to the Kansas Children's Cabinet. We meet on the third Friday of every month and those meetings are um, live streamed as well as recorded. So you can always go back and um, listen to those on the Children's Cabinet website. So uh, to recap what's been happening lately, um, in July, we rolled out a new meeting format when we had our second year begin, and that work continues. And that consists of work groups that are meeting during the second hour of the regularly scheduled monthly meetings. And each of uh, these groups are focused on the areas of childcare recruitment and retention, 
family partnerships and quality and environments. And so they are proving to be meaningful and productive work groups so far. I'm receiving good feedback from the members on this new format, but we are going to plan to do a poll with them in the October meeting just to kind of touch base on that and see how we wanna shape the work um, moving forward. So we anticipate that the first phase of these uh, work groups will take, uh, will finish by the end of 2021. And the potential outcomes from these work groups uh, could be the development of action plans to address priority issues that the groups uh, identify, or if they could also involve bringing recommendations to the full panel for consideration that then could be elevated and brought forward to you at some point in time. So I wanted to bring that to your attention, similar to the kindergarten transitions toolkit work that we um, brought forward to you last year for approval. So um, please stay tuned for what that might look like um, during the next few months, uh, possibly at your next meeting or in February uh, by chance. Um, and that's all I have for the update. I did need to give you notification that panel member Lori Kravitz from KDHE has resigned from the panel uh, due to her leaving her position there. And then also we have received a new panel applicant for your consideration, Kate Rogenbaum, who is the incoming Title V delegate with the Family Advisory Council. And um, so I think at this point, unless there's any questions, I'll turn it back over to Kim or Melissa to walk you through the approval process for both of those. Okay. I don't want to hold us up here. I know we're running out of time, but I am curious, what kind of feedback are you getting about the kindergarten transition document? I mean, do you get some questions and I mean, does it seem to be being picked up around the state for utilization? I have heard um, from individuals as I've worked throughout the network that, you know, they are utilizing that. That's always exciting news. And, um, you know, that's a good question, Kim. I think it would be a good idea for us to circle back to that and maybe ask that question at an upcoming panel meeting just to get an update on it. Because we do hope that all of that work is, uh, is out there and being used and uh, making things better for children that are transitioning into kindergarten. Well, it seemed to be a pretty impressive document to me, and I thought it seemed to be tailored at, at language that communities could use, uh, you know, as practical. So I'm just curious what kind of results we're seeing. Melissa, you want to? I think, um, Amanda, do you want to weigh in? I, I just have an anecdote. I, I experienced a program that was using it. I wasn't there to to test that. I it, it just was what they shared with me. I toured the Kansas Children's Discovery Center. They utilized that toolkit as part of the Shawnee County partnership. All of the school districts teamed up and the Discovery Center served as the, the site for summer programming that, that involved the school districts as part of their kindergarten um, efforts to, to prepare kids and, and do some fun activities. So I, 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 I was there to look at uh, an exhibit they had running all summer about bees. And I, I had the, the, the nice um, experience of hearing of you know, the success of that particular toolkit that the cabinet approved. And this is Amanda Peterson. I'll briefly share that Shawnee County is one of about a dozen communities who are going through an intentional process of they've brought together partners and are working on issues related to kindergarten transitions. Um, some of those are receiving the kindergarten readiness subgrants that are supported by the preschool development grant, which were grants of up to $25,000 to do those kinds of projects. So many of them are using this toolkit as an important piece of their work. Um, and we also know that there are quite a few districts who are using it so that they can fulfill the federal requirement that they have a written agreement in place with Head Start programs that are transitioning students into their schools. So we, we certainly uh, know that there are quite a few communities that are using it, Kim. Well, and it'll be good to follow up and see what, you know, we're learning. And there may be suggestions from some of those practitioners about even improvements on what seemed to be an already pretty good product. So, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a, an element of business here that I don't think it's going to, we think we can just do a voice vote on. That's to accept the resignation and approve a new member, uh, which is showing there on your screen. Can I have a motion to, about that? 
This is Senator Sykes. I make the motion that we accept Lori's resignation and accept Kate as a new member to the panel. All right. Is there a second? Second. Was that Delise? I... Tyler Smith second. Ah, uh, sorry, Tyler. No I worries. Didn't, I didn't. I didn't catch the. I didn't catch the 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 flash there quick enough. Um, so moving and seconded to approve these uh, recommendations in membership. Uh, all in favor, let's, uh, uh, first of all, I think everybody's on the screen so I can see you if you'll, well, Diane, Deanne, I'm going to have to ask you to speak, but uh, everybody else uh, could wave uh, thumbs up at me. I'm seeing John, Delise, Tyler, Lietta, uh, myself, and Diane, are you in favor? Deanne, I'm sorry. Um, yes. Oh, yes. I see you. I see you. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. I'm to on the plane. Show. I'm about to have to drop off. And Tyler, this is our last. Think, Tyler, do you have a thumbs up there? I'm sorry. Missed you. All right. All right. We have unanimous approval for that Perfect. motion. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Um, we'll come back when there's a new hire at KDHE. There will be a new appointment. Let's quickly, while Deanne is still holding on, the net, the I'll skip my director's update in favor of talking about the 2022 meeting agenda. Um, we Our next meeting is December 3rd. It will be virtual. Um, the proposed meeting schedule, will what we're proposing is we continue with the alternate months, first Friday morning, 9 a.m. So the, the dates are on screen, February 4th, April 1st, June 3rd, August 5th, October 7th, and December 2nd would be those, those Friday mornings. We've checked um, April is not Good Friday, so we will not throw that that curveball. Um, we will stick to this schedule. There is always uncertainty with with um, legislative calendars, and and I know all of you have uh, professional lives that sometimes and personal lives that sometimes interfere. But we have um, been fortunate to always have a quorum. So I. I just wanted to to allow the cabinet to weigh in um, before determining. I don't, and Kim, if you want to ask for uh, approval, or I, I don't know how you want to handle this, but that's what we're recommending. Well, I don't think. Well, yeah. I, I think we'll just ask for comments, and if we don't see any negative comments, I think we're okay. I don't think this requires yeah. formal action. So, how does everybody feel about continuing this schedule? Does it seem like they're frequent enough? Does it seem like uh, the dates as good as any we're going to come up with, especially if we have it in advance. Any any input from anybody? I I think I think we can just move forward with Perfect. that. Perfect. That's um, that makes me happy. It's routine that we've established, so we're just trying to stay consistent. Um, and so now I'll take. Thank you. Um, cabinet. I, I would like a moment um, with the director's update. I, I won't belabor um, other points. I want to um, thank Senator Sykes for her service as a member of the cabinet. This is her last meeting. Um, and I, I will miss you as, as a member of our, our cabinet, but I know you will remain a very strong supporter of our work and are well positioned in the Senate to, to uh, carry the message forward among your colleagues. So I, I wish there, I, I, since I, I arrived here, I've wondered about our transition. There's, there's no real ceremony. So it just, just heartfelt gratitude for, for your um, approach to our work and your, your, the time you've given us. Thank you. You're going to make me cry. I, I almost started. <laughs> too, but, yeah. yeah. Um, John, don't worry. You're still my appointment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I will continue to and do all that I can. You know, I truly believe this is the best investment we can make in our state, and it affects so many other things. And so I will continue to be a champion. And um, anything I can do in my capacity in the Senate, um, let me know. But Thank you all for what you do. It's been an honor to serve. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, well, I, I think I, I will gift back um, the rest of your morning to all of you. There's, there's plenty of work going on, plenty to talk about, but um, I, think, I think we all would benefit from calling this 
meeting to a close. So Kim, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Well, uh, appreciate that, Melissa. Do we do? It is good to hear about all the good work that you and the staff and, and our other state agencies are doing. I think it's been an interesting and productive um, morning. So thank you all for your participation. And to those listening in from around the state, uh, we're, we're glad to have energy and participation uh, in support of early childhood all over the state. So it's uh, glad you could join us today. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Have a great weekend.